I feel very jealous. Jealous because you have all the people here that you have to spend a lifetime to meet any one of them. You get them all in one, one place. And I compare myself at your age whether I would have been anywhere near that kind of lucky like you are. And then listening to President Bill Clinton. How many of you in the world get the chance to see face to face and listen to him? I feel jealous, at the same time I feel very lucky. Lucky to be able to be here with you. It's a fantastic opportunity for me to meet you and talk to you about some of the things I did. And all the things I did, I think, I did in a wrong way. But it came out right. That's a very funny thing that happens to me. I did <clears throat> start doing, excuse me, <clears throat> lending money to the poor people. And anybody would say that's the wrong thing to do. And I jumped into it out of the situation of the frustrations that you go through in a country like Bangladesh. Nothing happening. You dream about things, never materialize. It gets worse every day. So you jump at anything that you can do. And you don't look for things to learn. You just jump it because it needs to be done. That's how it happened. And I also do things which I know nothing about. And finally, it works out. And I, one of the best things when people say, how did you do the microcredit? I said, one of the best things that happened, I didn't know anything about banking. If I knew banking, no way I would do something like this. <laughs> so not knowing something is maybe a blessing sometimes. You are open. You can do things in your way without worrying about the rules or the procedures and so on and so forth. And tell me, how did you do those kind of rules, procedures for Grameen Bank? I said, that was simple. I didn't know anything about banking. So every time I needed a rule or a procedure, how to do that, I have to look back. What do the conventional banks do? And I look at very carefully how they do it. Once I learn how they do it, I just do the opposite. <laughs> and it worked out. So that's what the microcredit is all about. Conventional banks go to the rich, we go to the poor. Conventional banks go to men, particularly in Bangladesh. 99% of the borrowers are men. I went to women. 97% of our borrowers are women. We have eight and a half million borrowers. And you can imagine it's a bank for the women. And conventional banks are owned by rich people. Grameen Bank is owned by poor people, the borrowers. They own the bank. Poor women, they own the bank. So everything you see, conventional banks need collateral. Without collateral, they're not going to talk to you. We said, forget it. Poor people don't have collateral. Why you ask for that? So we dismissed the whole idea of collateral. Everybody was shocked. How can you do banking like that? I said, let's try. I could try because I didn't know anything. I tried and it worked. We have no collateral. We lend out billions of dollars. No collateral. Since we don't have collateral, we don't have lawyers. <laughs> this is the only lawyer-free bank in the whole world. So don't, don't get scared if you don't know something. Don't feel that you have to be very smart to do something. Stupid people like us do things, it works out. <laughs> so that's the fun part of it. Don't feel scared about challenging things. Conventional bankers are always telling me, we, don't lend, we can't lend money to the poor people. You know why? Because they're not credit worthy. I have heard it millions of times telling me that they are not credit worthy. I wondered, should the banks tell people whether they are credit worthy or not? Or that 
people should be telling the banks whether they are people worthy or not. You refer, you reverse the whole question. Then you get it. So doing the opposite way, doing the stupid way, is not a bad thing. Today, microcredit is everywhere, all over the world, including in this country, in the United States. We run a bank in uh, New York City, five branches, 10,000 borrowers in the last four years. Repayment, 99.3%. Average loan, $1,500. Works beautifully for women. All 10,000 borrowers that we have, all are women. And the same city which flourishes with the payday lenders, a flourishing business. Interest rate, 100%, 500%, 1,000%, who cares? So we had a very screwed up banking system. It doesn't work for people. It works for corporations. It works for big guys not for the common people. But that's a very important thing, financial service. That transforms everybody's life. So this is a challenge. How do you do that? How do you expand it? How do you make financial system work for people? So really nobody is rejected from that system. I ask myself, why poverty in the world? Is there something wrong with those poor people? I've been working with them all my life. And I have, every time I ask that question, the answer is the same. Poverty is not created by the poor people. It's created by the system. System which made up all those institutions, policies, and all the big things that we hear about. They are the one in the wrong side, which created poor people. So poverty is in the system, not in the people. People are as good as anybody could be. I give the example of bonsai tree. I said, you take the seed of the tallest tree in the forest and put it in a flower pot and let it grow. It grows only this big. It doesn't grow tall. And you wonder what happened to this tree. Is there something wrong with the seed? No, we got the best seed. Then the problem is the pot, the flower pot that we put. It didn't grow because it didn't have the nourishment to grow. I said, poor people are bonsai people. Nothing wrong with their seeds. Simply system didn't work for them. You can go case by case where system fails you. Look, and the conceptual framework fails you. Look at the conceptual framework of the business. If you are in business, you have to make money. That's what the business is all about. Profit maximization. I wonder, why is that so? I started creating another kind of business. Again, the opposite kind of business. The first rule is, I don't want to make money. That's the first rule of my business. See? It's again the opposite. See, I, something wrong with me. <laughs> so I started doing that kind of business, and it worked. I said, this business will be to solve problems. Whatever problem I see, I create a business to solve the problem, and it worked. I created more than 60 different companies, some of them big companies in the country, nationwide companies, but never had the intention of making a penny out of those companies for myself. But the company earns money, it makes profit, profits, it stays with the company, and so on. We created many of them, like, for example, simple thing, cooking stove. You know cooking stove is a killer? Most of our countries, you know, we are all over the world. One of the major cause of death of women in Bangladesh is respiratory disease. Where does it come from? Cooking. Inhaling all the time. Lifelong. Their children getting respiratory diseases. But there are beautiful stoves already designed, demonstrated, but it doesn't get there. So we created a business. We'll sell the stoves. Government tried to give them free, but it never got anywhere. So I started selling those stoves. And we have a big marketing, and we cover our cost, and people are happy to have it. Now everybody in Bangladesh has cell phones. Again, we had a cell phone company. 
created already. So everybody has cell phone. We said, just give us a call and we'll come and install you and try it out. If it doesn't work, we'll take it back. Once they get used to it, they don't want to leave it. And they pay for it. And that's it. And we started calling them social business. Non-dividend company to solve problems. You can do it in any direction. Doesn't matter what the problem is. Whether it's a, it's a problem of poverty, problem of employment, healthcare, and so on. So that's the kind of new challenge. Why can't we create business to solve problems? And this is not opposed to the conventional businesses. I said, create all the conventional businesses as you can. But parallelly, for every business, you can have a one social business alongside, addressing the problem that you see along the way. So we can create, and many of those companies now, big companies having parallel social business companies with us. We created a company with Adidas, German company. They asked me what kind of social business we can do. I said, maybe you should create a separate company as a social business and have a mission statement. What will be the mission statement? They asked me. I said, maybe your mission statement would be, nobody in the world should go without shoes. As a shoe company, it's our responsibility to produce shoes to sell, which is be affordable to the poorest people. The CEO looks at me with the big eyes. He said, but that's a big ambition. I look at him, I say, but Adidas is a big company. <laughs> Do you want me to give you a small ambition? Then he thought for a while, said, no, no, no. Let's think about it. I said, yes, please think about it. So thought about it for hours while I was given a guided tour of the facility and so on. <laughs> and at the lunchtime, he asked me, whispers into my ears, my colleagues are asking me how cheap the shoot should be in order to be affordable to the poorest people. I said, that's simple, maybe under one euro. He says, you are a very difficult man. <laughs> I said, I'm not difficult, I'm situation is difficult. That's why we need Adidas or somebody like you. They took it very seriously. They worked for two years to produce those shoes and finally made it. It's under one euro. Now they are producing and selling it. Idea is we can solve problems. Businesses have enormous technology in their command. If you can direct that technology, that creative power in that direction, problems can be solved. And I'm lucky to talk to you because you are the most creative of all generations in human history. You don't believe it, do you? I believe in it. Not because I'm talking to you, because you are lucky you are born in this age. B before you are born, there was a country called Soviet Union. Nobody but Herbert. There's something called Cold War. What is Cold War? There's something called Berlin Wall. What is Berlin Wall? As if it's some centuries back we're talking about. So only be just before you are born. There used to be something called Walkman. Did you hear about Walkman? <laughs> See, it's a laughing thing. If you want to find a Walkman, you have to go to a museum to find it out. <laughs> so today, it's a completely new generation and the most powerful generation in the human history, that's you. Your creative power, your command over technology can change the world just like that. World changes so fast. I just give you the example 20 years, 25 years ago, what the world was like. Can you imagine what the world would be in 20 years from now? Completely different. It will be science fiction, I can tell you. Things you think impossible will be routine thing. 50,000 songs in this little thing, people say, this is crazy. This is a Star Trek story. <laughs> what will happen 25 years from now, 20 years from now, 15 years from now? We can't even imagine. The distance between impossible and possible getting closer and closer and closer. Your chances, pick up the impossibles while it is lasting, 
because soon it will be gone. You'll, ch you'll be missing your chance. Pick it up. Be the one who made it possible. Each one of you have the capacity to do that. It's not an art shattering thing that one has to have. Just a normal person with a little bit of attention that I want to do it, make it happen. Imagine the world that you want to live in. Just imagine. It will happen. If you don't imagine, it will never happen. It will be a horror story, maybe, which you didn't want, got it done, because you didn't imagine something good for yourself. So that's the thing that we have to work out. Why there should be poverty? You ask yourself and decide, we want to build a world, there will be no poverty. Not a single person in the whole planet will be called a poor person. It's possible. And that's what the MDG goals are all about, reducing poverty by half by 2015. What would we do in 2030? Zero. Let's make it happen. It's possible. There's no fault of the people. People can be just like anybody else. Why should anybody be unemployed? Tell me, I cannot understand that. Is there something wrong with people, those who are unemployed? in Europe, in USA, or anywhere in the world, or throughout the whole world. Unemployment is the news in the United States. In Bangladesh, probably employment is the news. It's such a rare thing. <laughs> but why should anybody be unemployed? Does it mean something is wrong with the person? No. This young person is active, as creative, as enterprising as anybody else. Why is he or she unemployed? Why should the system trash the person? Shouldn't we raise the same kind of question? Shouldn't the unemployed or the people should be trashing the system rather than system trashing the people? And I kind of jokingly say that, have you ever heard an animal being unemployed? I never heard of it. If you heard of any animal unemployed, probably it's owned by a human being. Otherwise, animal doesn't remain animal. How come with all our knowledge and technology and everything, we have to have something called unemployment? It's nothing, no fault of people. So why can't we redesign the system where the word unemployment will not be understood? What does it mean? I have the capacity, I do things, I take care of myself, I take care of the world. How can you be unemployed? What, is, what does it mean? So it's a question of redesigning the system. So that's your job, redesigning the system. And one of the ways to come to it is, as I said, if you see the problem, design a business. And you are, you are the most creative person. You don't have to have the money to run a social business. All you need is a creative idea. Once you have done that, it's possible. Let's create that world. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.